evening and welcome to worship. Good evening. It's good to know that you are alert. Uh, we are continuing into the last few chapters of the book of Esther as we journey through this whole book, through the season of Lent. So it is great to continue into the book of Esther and what fun it is to cover a whole book over one season. I only see a few parents who are here in worship, so that means the rest of you be aware you have to sign the bottom of the sermon notes and you have to write what you heard from the sermon. Just a heads up, I see less parents, they're gonna come after you guys. Especially grandparents, they'll come after you. Okay. That is all my announcements. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that you may perfectly love you and mercifully magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We sing together our first So just 
sit, don't fall asleep on me, and listen to the ending of, of Esther. Chapter 7. So the king and Haman went to, into the feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Even to half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition. And the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we have been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who is presumed to do this? Esther said, a foe and an enemy, the wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen, and the king rose from the feast in wrath and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that the king was determined to destroy him. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where Esther was reclining, and the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbana, one of the king of the king's eunuchs and attendants, said, Look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, stands at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to the queen Esther the house of Haman. The enemy of the Jews and Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he had said to her. Then the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. So Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet, weeping and pleading with him to avert the evil design of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. The king held out a golden scepter to Esther, and Esther rose and stood before the king. She said, if it pleases the king, and if I have won his favor, and if the things seem right before the king, and I have his approval, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamatha, the Agite, which he wrote in giving the orders to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear the destruction of my kindred? The king Ahasuer said to Queen Esther and to the Jew Mordecai, See, I have given Esther the house of Haman. They have hanged him on the gallows because he plotted to lay hands on the Jews. You may write as you please to regard the Jews. In the name of the king, seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. The king's secretaries were summoned at that time in the month, third month, which is the month of Sivan, of the 23rd day of the edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews and to the straps and to the governors and the officials of all the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces to every province in its own script, to every people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. He wrote letters in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed them with the king's ring, and sent them by mounted courier, courtiers riding fast on steeds bred from the royal herd. By these letters, the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to assemble and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, to annihilate any armed forces of any people of province that might attack them with their children and women and to plunder their goods on a single day throughout the provinces of the king Ahasuerus on the 13th day of the 12th month of the month of Adar. 
a copy of the writ was issued as a decree in every province and published to all peoples. And the Jews were ready on that day to take revenge on their enemies. So the courtiers mounted on their swift royal steeds, hurried out, and urged at the king's command. The decree was issued in the citadel of Susa. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king, wearing royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a mantle of fine linen and purple, while the city, the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced, for the Jews there was light and gladness, joy and honor in every province and every city where the king's command and his edict came. There was gladness and joy among the Jews, a festival and a holiday. Furthermore, many of the peoples of the country professed to be Jews because of the fear the Jews had fallen upon them. Now in the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, on the 13th day, when the king's command and edict were about to be executed, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain power over them, but which had not changed to a day when the Jews would gain power over their foes. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king at his heirs to lay a hand on those who sought their ruin, and no one could withstand them because the fear of them had fallen upon all peoples. All the officials of the provinces, the straps, the governors, the royal officials, the supporting the Jews because the fear of Mordecai had fallen upon them. For Mordecai was powerful in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces as the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. So the Jews struck down all their enemies with a sword, slaughtering and destroying them, and did as they pleased to kill those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 people. I'm going to skip over the names of these people because they're really hard, but it's several people. The ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they did not touch the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king. The king said to Queen Esther, in the citadel of Susa, the Jews have killed 500 people and also the 10 sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. Esther said, if it pleases the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict. And let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were, who were in Susa gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 persons in Susa but they did not touch the plunder. Now the other Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and gained relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar and on the 14th day they rested and made a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th day and rested on the 15th day, making the day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the open towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as the day for which gladness and feasting, a holiday on which to send gifts of food to one another. Mordecai recorded all these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus both near and far, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day of the same month year by year, as the days in which the Jews gained relief from their enemies, as the month has been turned for them from sorrow into gladness, from mourning into holiday, that they should make the days of feasting in gladness, days of sending gifts to one another and presents to the poor, so the Jews adopted a custom what they had begun to do. As Mordecai had written to them, Haman, the son of Hamagat the Agite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast her, that is the lot, to crush and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, 
He gave orders in writing that the wicked plot that had been devised against Jews should come upon his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, these days are called Pearl, from the word Pearl, thus, because all that was written in this letter and in what had happened faced them in this manner and of what had happened to them, the Jews established and accepted as a custom for themselves and their descendants, all who joined them without fail, they would continue to observe these two days every year as it was written and at time appointed. These days should be remembered and kept through every generation in every family, province, and city. And these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among the descendants. Queen Esther, daughter of Epithel, along with the Jews, Mordecai gave full written authority confirming the second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to wishing peace and security to all the Jews, to 127 provinces of the kingdom of Athusaris, giving the orders that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons as the Jews, Mordecai and Queen Esther, enjoined on the Jews just as they had laid down for themselves and for their descendants regulations concerning their fasts and their lamentations. The command of Queen Esther fixed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. King Ahuserus laid tribute on the land and on the islands of the seas, all the acts of his power and might, and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him, and are they not written in the annuals of the king of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next in rank to King Ahuserus, and he was powerful among the Jews, and popular with his kindred, for he sought the good of his people, interceded for the welfare of his descendants. This is the end of Esther. Quite a long story at the end. It was getting a little tedious of the small little details, but this book of Esther ends with the details of creating this festival of Purim, where they read the entire book of Esther. So now we have read the entire book of Esther together in worship. So at the end of this book, it is great to look back then on the wonderful and humorous parts about the reversal of fortune, how the heroes rise up and the villains fall down. If you were to fold this book up like a story, you would see symmetry between the first and second half. Chapter one and two, the king of Persia's greatness. And at the end, chapters nine and 10, Mordecai's greatness. One step in, chapter beginning of chapter three, Haman is elevated. And at the end of chapter eight, Mordecai is elevated. One more step in, in the ending of chapter three, Haman's decree to kill all the Jews and at the beginning in the middle of chapter eight, we have Mordecai's decree to save all the Jews. One more step in and it's chapter four, the plan. And with its symmetry is the plan developed in the beginning of chapter eight. One more step in is chapter five, Esther's first banquet with chapter seven, Esther's second banquet. And at the middle of this book is where the pivot point of chapter six, where all the reversals start happening. The fortune starts to favor our heroes. It is a book that can be folded up and matched, but one bad thing is responded with one good thing. And that's what makes this good a good story, this reversal of fortune of good heroes overcoming the evil conquerors. So you begin to look for God's activity the silent but active work to save Esther's people. But it's really in the ironic reversals and the humor to defeat the opposition that really claimed the story together. The irony of Haman begging for his life after planning the people's death throughout the whole book, only to get hanged on the gallows that he built at his own house. For Mordecai, it was being given Haman's household and government position 
after Haman kept seeking out to kill him throughout the whole beginning of, book, of the book. But the most ironic part of this book of Esther is the Jews were given the greatest reversal. They go from having this huge mass genocide being planned and given authority by the government, but instead they get the king's permission to defend themselves and be saved across the entire kingdom. It is the great irony that makes it so humorous and a humorous story to read aloud. But when you're looking for God's activity, you're also looking about, wondering about the survival, especially about the survival of the minority and the cost of discipleship. When trying to survive and continue to live as a follower of God, in a culture where you're the religious minority, there are choices to make about how to worship and obey God. The cost of discipleship for Esther could have been death on top of being told to be a king, queen to a ridiculous king. The cost for Mordecai looked like public mourning of injustice, leading Esther to save their people and being called into a role to serve the king. In the book of Esther, we are assured of God's deliverance and called to bold service to the neighbor. God was active in delivering the people and Esther and Mordecai were called into bold service to serve their neighbor. And that is why the Jewish people can celebrate with the festival of Purim that is begins with the, this ending of this book. Because God delivers and enjoying celebration, they share the gifts with their neighbors. But we are people and Christians of the New Testament. So in light of the good news of the New Testament, we come to know that Jesus fulfills all the promises of the Old Testament. The celebrations created in the Old Testament are fulfilled. For Esther and the festival of Purim, it is the celebration of God's deliverance. And with the cross and resurrection from the grave, we know that Jesus has delivered us. Looking towards the cross and Easter, and the empty tomb, we know that Jesus has delivered us from sin and death to be give us freedom and life. And that is how we know God is at work. Amen. After hearing the word of God, we come to our time in our service to confess our sins. At times, we have to confess our sins because we forget that God has indeed delivered us, delivered us from sin and freed us through his grace. As you are able, please stand. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immoral, have mercy on us. For the self-centered living, for the failing to walk with humility and gentleness. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immoral, have mercy on us. For the longing to have what is not ours, and for hearts that are not at rest with ourselves. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and have mercy on us. For the misuse of human relationships, and for the unwillingness to see the image of God in others. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and have mercy on us. For jealousies that divide families and nations, and for rivalries that create strife and warfare. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For reluctance in sharing the gifts of God, and for the carelessness with the fruits of creation. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For hurtful words that condemn, and for angry deeds that harm. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and have mercy on us. For idleness in witnessing to Jesus Christ and for squandering the gifts of love and grace. 
God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were in dead in sin, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Amen. As part of confessing and receiving forgiveness is we extend that to our neighbor. So the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us extend that peace to our neighbors. We receive our offering as in the back of our worship space, but we also receive it as a, uh, with joyful and glad hearts. Together we will sing our hymn, Beautiful Things. Life springs from death. 
to make the beautiful things which you redeem your creation which awaits the resurrection restore the lost habitats and endangered species create new possibilities for areas affected by climate change grant relief from natural disasters and nurture new growth let us pray have mercy on us Jesus was handed over to the powers of this world, and all nations instruct the powerful that they would not exploit their power but maintain justice. Sustain all those who need to lead. Let us pray. You call followers to tend to Jesus' body and death. Sustain hospice workers and funeral directors those who work in ministries of healing and those who work in ministries of death and dying. Prepare all of us as we enter into Holy Week this next week, as we see that the cross is not the end, but it is the empty tomb that brings us hope. Let us pray. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Together we pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Christ has made you free. Thanks be to God.